Hey guys, we got another Sunday episode coming for you. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Sawcast. I'm Patrick. I'm Matt. I'm Garrett. And I'm Owen. The Mariners are currently 10 and 12 and in fourth place in our division. It's not the best start ever, but at least we know the Mariners are never going to be in last place because we share a division with the Oakland A's, who are an embarrassment to baseball, unfortunately. I mean, it's good for us, but sad for the team. The fans. Yeah, I feel bad for Oakland A's fans. I mean, they're, they're just completely atrocious, and at least we can take some solace in knowing that no matter how bad the Mariners are, we don't have to compete with that shit show that's going on over there in Oakland. I mean, they don't even have a major league competitive roster. Uh, they're like four and eighteen right now to start the season. Um, they're they're gonna lose a hundred fifteen plus games. It's real sad side over there. So at least we got some positives to look forward to. We're not the A's. Yeah, that's right. I mean. The Mariners have been building up. We've had all this momentum. The A's are in shambles. You know, we're gonna see them soon. Hopefully, we can pick up some steam out of uh, the series with them. Uh, the Mariners—they've been middling. They've been struggling. We've been putting ourselves in tough spots. There's a few clean games, a few things to hang our hat on, but you know, it's been tough. It's you know, harumph. It's it's rough. Yeah, it sucks. They're not a bad team, but they are playing shitty baseball. Yeah, and, you know, there's definitely, we have bright spots to look on. It's just not all the pieces are clicking right now, and it's still early, and I mean, you know, beating a dead horse, but wait until the middle or end of June, and, you know, that's when the weather starts to get warmer and the Mariners play better at home. They currently have a losing record at home. They're 7-9 and nine at home games, which is not what you want to see. You should always be over 500 when you're at home. And I think we'll see that change later on in the season. I mean, just last year before the Mariners really started making their push, they were 10 games under 500 with like just a couple weeks to go into the all-star break. And then they went on that 14 game win streak and it really turned the tide of the season, but they were, they were really bad at the start of last year too. And one thing, like, we don't want to be too doom and gloom about it. It's so easy to just be like, oh, tune out. These guys are shit. Because they're not. They're just not firing on all cylinders right now. And I think it will come around eventually. So I'm not too worried about it yet. It is so funny to me to slip back into a uh, depressed Mariners fan <laughs> after every single loss, though. Oh, yeah. It's so easy, Sell the bro. team. Tear it down. <laughs> get baseball out of Seattle <laughs> for nothing. There's plenty of season left. Yeah, it's really easy to fall into that rut again. You know, it's it's really deep. Um, yeah, we know though the Mariners are better than they've ever been. Uh, that there's a lot more potential than what's being shown. There are huge bright spots. It's just that you know when does it come together for the Mariners? Always, it's always in the summertime when we get streaks going, when the weather's nice, when the stadium's packed, when the atmosphere is like nice and booming you know everything's kind of choppy right now i'd say weather wise in seattle and for the mariners yeah it's really hard to be at the stadium in april and sometimes even may it's really cold it's always overcast and it's just not necessarily like a real like a very fun time you're just sitting there like (laughs) i hope they close the roof you know because at least like it'll trap some of the warm air it's just (laughs) It's just not necessarily a, a fun experience just because of the weather. So the Brewers came into town and swept us, and that kind of hurt. Like, we want to get at least one of those games, hopefully two of those games. They're not a bad team. They've been clicking and hitting the ball. Um, Corbin Burns got injured while he was pitching against us. We couldn't take advantage. Uh it was a rough series. Uh, we came back and played a couple clean games against the Cardinals and won two out of three. Um, we lost today Sunday afternoon. It was just it was kind of weird. We almost had a sweep, swept, sweep homestand because we swept the we 
sweep the opening series, then got swept by the Brewers, and we almost swept the Cardinals today. Uh, unfortunately, flexing couldn't get it done, and that is a big topic of discussion for us. Uh, I'm going to have to eat my words and say, you know, I was wrong. I really thought flexing was the best kept secret in baseball. And he had an amazing year last year. He really did. And I thought that him getting regulated to the bullpen was a mistake, especially with how well he was pitching. And we've sang his praises pretty early on in the season, but it, he's made it clear that it's just not clicking, and it doesn't look like it's about to click. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, oh, oh, it's there. It's just one mistake here or there. He's just not getting it done, and it's very unfortunate. High hopes for Flexton, but, yeah, he's not that dude. Yeah, I mean, he's had, like, almost three bad outings, three bad starts in a row, and, you know, even today, you can blame a little bit of the loss on maybe Colton Wong fumbling that double play ball. A lot of it. (laughs) <laughs> but I mean, they going into that inning, that was like, what, the third or the fourth? He had already given up like eight hits, and all of them were like really solid hits and like two home runs. And it's just like, even if we got that double play, like, I don't know if he would have uh, been put into the next inning or if he did. Like, I did not have a lot of hope for him to get through innings cleanly. Yeah, Chris Flexen is 0 and 4 with an 8.86 ERA right now. Oh, oh, woof. Man. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, we also talked a lot of shit about Marco Gonzalez, <laughs> and he's been performing. He's doing fine. He's been awesome. Yeah. He had an awesome start. His last one was so really good. Until really the Mariners' good. bullpen came in and immediately pissed it away. He tied his career high in strikeouts that game. Marco did, uh, what was it, like six-plus innings. And, yeah, bullpen fumbled that one for him. But Marco has really come around. And, yeah, he's earned that fifth spot. And Flexen needs to figure it out. From Boy, the were we wrong. We were wrong. I know. What a reversal of fortunes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all had high hopes for Flexen. And he's been really effective in the past. Um, this year has been different. He's been getting blown up. He's... You know, with his duels with his batters, he he's getting beat by the batter. The like he's not overpowering anybody. He's not really fooling anyone. He's had a couple decent starts where he looks good and can use all of his pitches effectively, but most of them, he's getting blown up. He's not effective with his off speed, so they can hunt fastball like they did today, and just blow him up. You know, he's he's not been effective. He can work the edges of the plate, but when he's not hitting it it's he's working from behind constantly and and the pit the batters get in good hitters counts and can really sit on a pitch and hit it like a good pitch in the zone to swing at so uh, Marco's been a lot more competitive with his pitches and he bites he he works the edges more and he's been more effective and he's proved that he can do that um, more consistently and yeah I mean we'll see what happens with flex in with Depends on how long Ray takes to get back. Yeah, I was going to say another thing about Flexen is you notice that he's miss, he's leaving everything up. It's like chest high. He's not burying stuff in the dirt, which at least, you know, if you're going to throw like wild, at least like if it's low or like in the dirt, there's a significant less chance that they're going to hit it extremely hard. But he's leaving everything from like waist to chest and hitters are just feasting all over it. They're hitting him hard, and like Matt said, you know he's falling behind in counts early, and so he has to come and try to be competitive, and instead he's just leaving shit in the upper parts of the zone, and he's getting tagged all over the field. It's pretty rough. And the unfortunate thing is that we were hoping that Robbie Ray would return soon from his injury. He went on the IL on his very first start, right, to start the season? Yeah, like the fourth inning. <laughs> yeah, it was his very first start, and we figured – Oh, it was a phantom IL stint. Like he was just going to go until the weather warmed up a little bit and kind of figure some shit out. And that's not the case. Now we're learning that he could miss up to another month. And so we're going to have to stay with Flexen. And I mean, I don't know what we're going to do with another month of Flexen if he keeps on this route that he's on because it's not even competitive out there. He is getting torn up on the field and we can't we can't have another month of an automatic loss in that fifth rotation spot and it sucks yeah Ray's injury now getting pushed back uh I'm wondering Munoz is supposed to be returning hopefully soon 
maybe within like the next uh, week and a half, two weeks. Hopefully he should be coming up against our upcoming series against the Oakland A's. And I'm wondering, this is all just spitball in here, but I wonder if we try to put Brash back in the starter spot. He is struggling his own right in the bullpen right now, but he does have starter experience. And if Flexen isn't getting it done, maybe going back to Brash in that kind of just temporary role. I don't know. I mean, it's an idea, but I don't think that's the move right now. I think they're really trying to work Brash into a high leverage role in the bullpen, and maybe they have to take a step back from that, but I don't think the right move would be putting him back in the rotation. He's having control issues. So, I, you know, I don't see them stretching Brash out. I think they would rather spot start a few guys from AAA to see how they perform at the major league level, and it's guys that major league teams haven't seen yet so they can be effective especially on their first start a lot of times when they're more amped up they might give a couple guys a test run or use tommy malone again who's back in triple a after he cleared waivers like bring I back was malone thinking. we can dfa so him again <laughs> we can use him instead of flexin like we used him before and he's that guy we have a couple guys that we could use down there that way and i think they'd do that rather than put brash back in the rotation It'd have to be a real disaster situation to get Brash back in the starting spot, I think. And I mean, I'm not even saying like it was the wisest move or whatever. I'm just saying if you're so handcuffed with options and maybe like not necessarily calling Malone up again just to DFA him immediately after or whatever, like maybe giving Brash a spot start. I don't I like I don't think it's the smartest move and like the winning move. But I'm just wondering, out of our bullpen, he is the one with starter experience. If we had to, yeah. Yeah, I'm That's just saying, like, last-ditch effort. It is a play that could be. It is last-ditch, though. Yeah, for sure. On the other hand, Luis Castillo has been holding it down. I mean, he went six perfect. We didn't even talk about it. Our last <laughs> podcast, and it had just happened. But, dude, he went six perfect, his second-to-last start. And then last night on Saturday, he... Gave up two runs, I think, and went over five innings, six innings maybe, over five. He got pulled a little earlier this time. But, I mean, he's been dominant. He didn't have his best shit against the Cardinals, and I could tell he was a little bit wild and letting the fastball fly a little bit. But um, he's awesome. He's so electric, and you can really count on that guy to give us a winning chance every time he pitches. And, I mean, his ERA is just over one now, I think. And he's striking dudes out. He's looking awesome every time he takes the mound. Uh, more starter praise. I saw George Kirby just set, it was like the highest strikeout to walk ratio in a pitcher's like first so many games since 1901. The dude just doesn't walk people. And George Kirby's last start, he had another game with zero walks. He has such good control. And Logan has had some really nice starts. I And again, when everything starts clicking, along with Castillo still performing as well as he is, I mean, our pitching staff is going to be one of the scariest in baseball. It is still really good with besides our kind of outlier starts. But our pitching staff is phenomenal. George Kirby's looking awesome. Like he just went over 150 strikeouts in his career and he's walked literally nobody compared to his strikeouts. Um, I think he's walked one guy on the year. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, he looks so good out there. He can use all of his pitches effectively. He's super confident. He knows when he's on what pitch is working. Um, if he gets into trouble, he's not phased. He just works through it and gets the outs he needs to get, you know, it's not rocky with him. You know what you're going to get, and he's given it. I like it a lot. He can really trust George Kirby. I don't, I don't know. We'll see what happens with Logan Gilbert and George Kirby on this next go around because those guys should be ace quality pitchers in the next few years if they develop in the way we think they can. And it's nice the Mariners have a rest day on Monday. It's a travel day, so it's not like a full rest day. But they did have an at-home day off on Thursday. And now on Monday, they're having a travel day. So that is also a good time 
for everyone just to kind of re reset, relax, get a breath in. Your bullpen arms stay more rested that way, especially when we had like that week straight where we had back-to-back -back extra inning games and starters getting pulled in like the fourth or fifth inning and our bullpen was taxed. So it's really kind of nice to give them this little bit of extra time before we uh, head off to Philly for a three-game series. Some other uh, bullpen news. You know, yeah, Brash has been struggling a little bit. Diego Castillo is not being used in situations that matter very much. Penn Murphy has been good. He's had a couple rocky appearances here and there, but on the whole, I'd say he's really solid. But what about our man Topa? That dude yeah, man. is phenomenal. Topa he, and Spire. Yeah, both of them coming in, locking stuff down. Been very, very impressed with those guys. We had a guy pitch in the ninth today, Saucedo, who I think this was his first appearance on the year. Never heard of him. He had no <laughs> stats. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, Taylor Saucedo. He's a left-handed pitcher. They called him up recently in the shuffle i don't know but um yeah that's right. cool it's good for him yeah he's we big. need you know we need lefties and he's available he can th throw darts until we have everybody we need back and ready andres munoz you know casey sadler's working his way back we have we have actually a few pitchers in the minor leagues that can jump up and down but topa has been awesome dude um i will say i was at the game on saturday night um brash came in and he was looking nasty, but he's not spotting the ball very well. Uh, I could even tell from left field bleachers, like, you know, his pitches are effective, but he's effectively wild when he's on. And uh, he hit a guy. He, had, he was ahead of him in the count. And I, like, looked away for two seconds and looked back and, like, oh, oh, he's walking to first. Like, we were ahead of – we were about to strike this guy out. Now he's on first. But he did end up striking out the rest of the guys like he's nasty but i don't know it's scary when he's in there he needs to have a little more control but he just lets it fly and it's hard to know if he's going to be on or not so using guys like topa spire pen murphy who have proven that they can get it done in those medium leverage situations might get more of a role towards the end with seawald and with munoz coming back to see how it works out our bullpen looks awesome we have so many weapons there, and these guys fit in perfectly. And also, uh, outside of that uh, Cleveland Guardians game where we went extra innings and we called up two fringe AAA guys, uh, BJ Bukaki and some other dude, and they kind of blew away that lead for us, I haven't really felt that any of these losses can be single-handedly pinned on our bullpen. It's not like we're coming in and like, going up ahead and then, you know, some Joe Schmo comes in and pisses away the lead. I feel like any situations we've kind of had has been more so on the team in general rather than just like a bullpen taking a victory away. That's very true. And today, the day game on Sunday against the Cardinals, you know who pissed away our lead? Colton Wong. <laughs> he didn't even get an error for this, but... I don't know how it's going under the radar, and is, but uh, Colton Wong, he had three hits today. Good for him. He raised his average to like 146. Cool. <laughs> I don't even think it's that high. It's like a 120. Yeah, either way. Um, JP snagged a low liner, middle infield, and the runner was off of second base. He tossed the ball to Wong. It's like less than 10 feet away. It looked like he was 10 feet away, and he did this little toss to Wong, and he'd like – didn't catch the ball he just like dropped i don't understand how we didn't double him up there the ball was there in plenty of time his foot was on the bag and he absolutely fumbled the thing and there no error like and then what happened three run home run the next batter like that we should have been out of that inning i don't care that colton wong got three hits today <laughs> yeah he's been hella stinky he blew it <laughs> Yeah, JP's throw was like a little low, but I think they were trying to double him up. And Colton Wong looked like he was trying to catch a pop up with like a raised mitt, and so it just fell yeah. right out of it. What is he doing? He bad. He's pretty bad. You know who's not bad? JP Crawford and Jared Kellenick. Hell yeah. I mean, 
Kellenick is he's now homered in two straight games again, starting another home run streak. And the craziest thing about Kellenick, I'm seeing him. He's a left-handed hitter, and left-handed hitters 95% of the time pull everything to right field. That's why the shift was so prevalent in years past. You can shift to the whole side and because left-handed hitters are normally going to hit it right to second base or right field. I am seeing Kellenick get pitches in on his hands, and he is getting his bat inside of the ball and hitting home runs to left field. And that is crazy. You never see that kind of shit with left-handed hitters. Right-handed hitters, it's like a little bit easier. Your stance is like different and stuff. It's a little bit easier to muscle that ball every which way. But left-handed hitters notoriously hit to one side of the field. So for him to not only get his hands on an inside pitch like that, but then to muscle it over the fence in left field, it's mind-blowing. It's so crazy watching him at that bat right now as dave sims would say that kid is some kind of strong (laughs) that's right yeah i mean at the game on saturday night he muscled one over the wall in left field that pitch from the left field bleachers i couldn't tell where it was located on the plate but when i watched later that pitch was located down and in towards the hands and like patrick's saying he's working inside out up the middle with power like putting the ball in the air with a nice short compact swing no extra load and loopiness it's like short hands just hands through really sweet swing i don't know how but he's putting the ball in the air with power to left field he's done it two games in a row just putting it in the pen out there it looks amazing I couldn't be happier. <laughs> it was so What's cool. Owen gonna say? <laughs> it was so cool to watch him hit a home run today, and it'll be lost, which is unfortunate. And then he he didn't do so good, so well the the rest of the game. He struck out, looking pretty silly against Flair, Flaherty. He's good. Um, he almost hit another one to like right center, but it was like warning track power. But he's killing it left field. He looks great. He like snagged a couple like where he had to run. You know, he did really good i i'm just so i'm just so thrilled that that man is like the up-and-comer i mean with no options left on his last legs he starts to shine it's like and he's shining bright this was the time to do it too what else what else do you have you either put up or shut up and god damn is he putting up right now yeah he's showing that he's got it it's nice we need it and he's been carrying us he's been carrying the freight yeah i think he has is I, is he leading the team in home runs right now? I mean, yeah, he's got to be. Teoscar's hitting bombs, but I think Kelnick's ahead of him. But um, either way, Kelnick, he's been super patient. He's like hunting pitches. He's looking for good pitches to hit in the zone. He's not chasing very much. He's in like the 99th percentile barrel rate super and like good exit velocity. Um, he is putting the barrel on the ball and sending it all over the place. And that's how you get hits. You know, if you put the ball in play hard, yeah, no. even, even Julio is, uh, he's not looking very awesome right now, but striking out a little bit. He, when he still hits the ball in the zone, like he hits it hard. He's hitting it hard right at guys. He's hitting it hard on the ground. He's just not, you know, in the zone yet. Looks like. Jared Kellenick and Teoscar Hernandez are leading the team in home runs right now. It looks like they have five apiece. I don't know if this got updated today or not, but it's either Kellenick or Teo. Yeah, I mean, Teoscar's really turning it around and showing that he's that guy. Also, I've got kind of a two-parter here. One with Julio not really coming around quite as hot yet and the amazing at-bats JP is putting on in the nine slot. Yes, It was a a game earlier in the week. The Mariners had a chance to come up big in the bottom of the ninth inning. JP, with two outs, worked an amazing walk to load the bases for Julio. And it was clear that JP, with his veteran presence and that veteran at bat, you know, got, got to the pitcher and made him work and work the count and got him to walk him to load the bases. Julio came up with a chance to be the star and he swung at the very first pitch and grounded right to the shortstop game over. And I think that's when someone like Carlos Santana 
on the bench or something a bit more of a veteran presence or even like the coaching staff too, telling Julio to take a breath in that situation. Yes, you want to be the star and yes, you are the star, but in a situation like that, you, you got to have a stronger at bat you and for JP to have his veteran presence, but now he's on first base. It's not like he can call time and go up and talk to Julio real quick. He just did his job. It was time for Julio to do his job and he got way over anxious and kind of limp dicked it to shortstop for a very, very anticlimactic end of the game. And those are the kind of plays where your stars need to show up. Yeah, Julio really wants to swing at the first pitch every so single hard. time. Yeah. Yeah, it's swinging hard too. Yeah. Um, JP, that was a pinch hit walk that mm. he worked there too. Huge moment. Stayed calm, worked the walk. I think he worked it full, worked the walk. And yeah, that gives Julio his opportunity. But is it like self-imposed pressure, right? Like, is he expecting too much of himself to perform? Because he does seem kind of clutched up on the bat, right? Maybe he's squeezing tight. He's when he's swinging, like we do in wiffle ball. If we're all clutched up and not loose, we'll rip at the ball and hit it into the ground. At you know, right at the shortstop, third baseman, all the time because we're so tight and like trying too hard where you know he needs to put that smooth swing on the ball have a little bit of finesse in that situation and really don't try to go yard here we just need a hit to the outfields you know yeah I think during spring training in our predictions episode I brought up uh Julio's the pressure that he might feel all this media attention and I mean him probably feeling like he has to carry a pretty big load this year I don't know he's a young kid he needs to go out there and just play ball like he did last year and just you know smile through it and just have the most fun he can because that's how he plays best is that partially Kellenic coming up and performing so well that he's like oh I mean now he's in that like we're constantly talking about the you know the pressure battle between Kellenic and Julio it's like Dude, be your own guy. You're both on the team now. There's no more competition. Julio's, Just get out there and do what you do. Julio's locked up for like 15 years. So <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, he, like how, what is yeah. Kellenic gonna? He's like gonna get a bigger call. I think Kellenic let that shit go long ago when Good. Julio got, got called up and then like produced pretty quickly. Whereas Kellenic had his struggles. I think he's just like. Yeah, like that's not my fight anymore. I'm just gonna do me, and he's been doing it. That's exactly what they both need to do. I want to go back though and kind of reiterate the I in a situation like that like yes Julio is still really young you need to have a veteran presence or the coaching staff someone that's like hey man take a breath here okay you've got a lot of pitches to do something with you don't need to come out and try to be a hero on this very first pitch especially when the guy before you just worked a walk so you see the first pitch you're you don't need to be a hero on the first pitch you're a star and you got to have that mentality of just being calm in those situations. And so, I mean, you can point the finger at any direction, like Julio putting too much pressure on himself or anything. But the point is someone needed to tell him to take a breath in that situation. Either he needed to tell himself or a veteran or a coach someone, Hey man, it's okay. You, you can do this, but you don't got to do it on the very first pitch. Yeah, I hope someone takes that initiative after the fact, too, when they go back and look at what happened. Because JP really did set the tone there. The veteran presence, the calmness, the understanding that you only swing at pitches that you can hit right now. And most likely, the more pressure is on the pitcher, you know? The pitcher can't give up those runs. There's already runners in scoring position. There's more pressure on the pitcher than the batter. And when JP works that walk and then Julio comes up there and is gripping it and ripping it, it's, it doesn't jive well. Like, uh, Julio needs to feel the moment better, have more feel for that moment so that he can perform in the way that the team needs. And he can actually fulfill the role that is there for him to fulfill in that situation. You know, he needs to work on situational awareness of what he needs to do. Definitely. It's like, what are the outcomes here? You swing out of your shoes on the first pitch, you're going to either hit a home run, which is what he's obviously trying to do. You're going to get a strike. You're starting 
behind in the count now. You're going to ground out possibly into a double play, which has happened a couple of times now. I mean, you're going to foul one back also behind in the count. I mean, just look at the first pitch. Take a breath. Exactly, Patrick. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and again, these are all stuff that will hopefully start clicking sooner rather than later. They've got time to figure it out, get everything kind of clicking at once. I will say another thing that is hurting us is Demo, Dylan Moore. Uh, His injury has been pushed back even longer. He was supposed to start his rehab stint in Tacoma. And during the like very first at bat or whatever, he felt something weird in his side. Yeah, yeah, he had that core surgery, and then he had like a flexor strain, something like that. Some oblique, it's oblique, oblique there you go. an oblique, oblique strain can be lingering as hell. You see it yeah. a, a lot of times, and so yeah, we were hoping that Demo was gonna come back and hopefully get a lot of time in at second base, and now that is pushed back to a TBD. There's no idea when he can come back and return, and that hurts. That, that does. Really sucks. We brought up that new kid Caballero though. Little middle infielder guy who's making contact with the ball, uh, really hitting the ball where they are instead of where they <laughs> ain't. But at least he's making contact, and I'm glad that he's swinging and doing his thing. So Caballero's an interesting call up. They also, I mean, everyone's been saying send back La Stella or DFA La Stella, and instead um, they sent down Cooper Hummel, which is like okay. I mean, Cooper Hummel has options, you know. He's, he hasn't been performing great. He got sent down. That's fine. Uh, La Stella hasn't really done much for us. He's been kind of a blank spot in our roster. He doesn't play defense. He is a DH and hasn't performed. At this point in his career, it seems like the option, the only option is to DFA La Stella and try to call up somebody anybody whether it be jake shiner Cade marlowe just got back from injury he's only had like 22 at bats on the year but he's hitting he's got a one dot ops in triple a so far and he's an exciting young guy i remember from uh watching spring training Cade marlowe looks like a really good hitter so we have a few options in triple a caballero seems pretty electric he has good energy he loves to Swing and hit the ball. He's fast. He stole a base. He can play good defense. We saw him play shortstop and second base. Uh, Colton Wong is struggling hard. Dylan Moore getting pushed back just makes a bigger spot for a guy like Caballero to be the next man up, fulfill that role, and he seems like he's there for it. He's focused. He's ready and uh, to do whatever he can to help this team and be on this team because he is just kind of being thrown into that role. And I like the potential that I see. I think DFA La Stella seems like a good way to open up a spot for someone else. Yeah, I was thinking about it the day before we found out about uh, Dylan Moore's continuous injury or whatever he's feeling. I was thinking about it. And I was like, okay, they're going to bring Caballero up, maybe send him back, bring him up, option him a couple of times. And then after hearing that news, it's like, oh, I guess Caballero's around now. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, yeah, let him get some at bats and some time in at the major league roster. He got his first career major league hit. It was a double. Yeah, that was good exciting. For so always happy for anyone to get their first major league hit. Like, what a cool moment. So congrats to him. Uh, yeah, and, you know, hopefully he gets some more time in the field and game time at bats. Sam Haggerty is back from his injury. So hopefully he can get some more playing time soon as well. That's what it was. Haggerty came back, and that's why they sent Hummel down, right? Yeah. Yeah, they needed to make room for Haggerty. Okay, yep. It all It's all clicking now. It all makes sense. But it really seems that the only – I mean, besides kind of like accumulation of problems in our lineup, like guys not clicking on all cylinders and everything like kind of – the only black hole we have right now is second base. Uh, there's no other position that we're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? It's literally only second base. Designated hitter is kind of a black hole. That is true. true. (laughs) I'll give you that. Yeah. Uh, That's not a position. (laughs) You're right though. Second base is a huge hole. DH, 
Um, at least Pollock's been taking better swings and hitting the ball on the like on the barrel. We can use Pollock for now because Listella doesn't seem viable, and we need to figure out what we're doing there soon. And at second base, I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of Haggerty at second base. I think we're going to see a lot of Caballero at second base. And when JP needs a day off, we'll see Caballero at short. It'll be fun. I like. Uh, I think we have a good rotation with those guys, and we need to get a couple hitters up that are someone hot, someone hitting. The other day when Eugenio Suarez got hit and he went down, he looked like he was in a lot of pain, I got immediately nervous about, oh, man, if he goes down, who's going to play third base? And I think the option is Listella. Maybe that's why the only other reason why they're keeping him around I would say Haggerty would probably fill that role better than Listella. Honestly, 100%. probably, yeah. They're not playing Listella in the field. He's not viable, I guess. I don't know. He's getting older, maybe. I think it's just time. For Is he the next that. option? I mean, you've got Haggerty. When's the last time he's played in the field? Does I have no know? idea. We yeah, have I more... just, yeah. when, some, when the next person comes back from injury, Listella's got to be gone. There's yeah. at least Pollock accidentally gets a hit from time to time. <laughs> it's I better mean, than Listella. Better than Listella. He can take a decent at bat half the time. And yeah, and so there's just we need these in- injuries to clear up and we need to have our everyday lineup set. And it's just it's not happening right now. Colton Wong ain't that guy. Nope. Um but We'll figure it out. We've got an upcoming series coming up against the Phillies and then the Blue Jays. The Phillies are performing about exactly the same as the Mariners right now. So who knows how that series can go. It will be on the road. So playing on the road is always harder than playing at home. But should have a good series. The Jays, the Toronto Blue Jays, are playing the Mariners as soon as the Phillies series is done. And that is going to be a hard-fought series Toronto is performing pretty well right now, uh, and we'll also be on the road in Toronto. So hopefully we can take, let's say, two or three from the Phillies, one of three from the Blue Jays, hopefully, and then we have the Oakland A's series after that, which sweep or bust against that embarrassment of a team. Yeah, we better sweep there. You know how the Mariners play against teams that they should be sweeping, though. Yeah, usually, but, I mean, this team is historically bad. The A's are, <laughs> it's bad over there. Coming off of the series with the Phillies, it's going to be tough because they are a good team. Like, the Mariners have a good roster, and we are a good team, but we're middling. So, same with them. They have a really good roster. They have a lot of guys. They can put up a lot of runs. Um and they're in the same spot we are with just a middling, an under 500 team like the Mariners are. We're just kind of trying to keep our head above water. And the Blue Jays, they've been playing well. They just played well against the Yankees. They can prove that they're a tough team. That's going to be an energetic series in Toronto. That place is going to go wild. Hopefully the Mariners can do some damage in there. We'll see. And then coming off of those series, I think sweeping the A's is going to be a walk in the park because we came off of tough. We're playing an easy team. You know what I mean? They have one pitcher though, that just got called up that throws hundred miles an hour. I forget his name, but the A's have one pitcher that I'm worried about and that's it. So if we have to face him, they might take one from us and I wouldn't be mad at it. Cause I want to see that guy pitch, but I want the Mariners to hit that hundred mile an hour fastball as well. Also, this is kind of interesting. The opening or the starter in the first game between the Phillies and the Mariners for the Phillies is former Mariner Taiwan Walker. Hey. Hey, pitching oh. for the Phillies against us on uh, the Tuesday game. I forgot he made his way over there from the Mets. Who are we going to have on Tuesday? Marco. Oh, yeah. Marco's cool. got another start, had a great start in his last start after coming back from paternity leave. Hopefully he keeps that going, and yeah, should be should be a fun opening ball game to set the tone for the series. I'm gonna be so happy if Marco has just you know a good season. He doesn't even have to be awesome. Just if he does what he did last time, all season, dude. Yeah, so stoked. He's proven that he can be effective, but let's see how often he can do that. Yeah, let's just see it consistently. So I just want to say overall, uh, the AL East. 
they're all over 500, all five teams, even the Red Sox. <laughs> um, the Central, not looking great. The top team is the Twins at like 12 and 10. And the West, the Rangers are on top. They've won like 14 games. They're 14 and 7. Houston's over 500 at 12 and 10. The Angels are 11 and 11. The Mariners, 10 and 12. So. We're we're kind of bunched up there. I think the Angels are going down. Houston's going up. The Mariners need to prove themselves. There's still a lot of time to turn this ship around and make things happen here when things start warming up in May and in June. Uh, these next few series are going to be tough, and it might be a roller coaster, but I'm ready to see the boys put up some runs in those stadiums, especially the Phillies place. We, they can put up some runs in that place. The Blue Jays dome place i don't what is that place called this is the dome place the dome, the dome place, place i think yeah, is yeah. the, the name. blue yeah, jays they call it out place there. <laughs> where they can like retract the roof and stuff uh they have a cool place uh but we can put up runs oh, that's there what, it's called the cool place that's cool yeah dome. yeah and cool then dome we gotta place. go to the shitty place uh the <laughs> literally <Coliseum>. shitty yeah <laughs> oakland the, a's sewage backs up they have possums that live in the press boxes <laughs> That place, oh my god. I'm surprised it just like hasn't been condemned by the city. It was a biohazard? Yeah, seriously. Dude, the, big, the craziest thing about that place to me is listening to the games on the radio when we're in their boots and stuff, our mm. broadcast team, and like, it's just not sound insulated at all. You can hear every song that's playing like very <laughs> loudly. You can hear Rick Riz trying to scream his way through a game, and you're like, let the poor old guy just talk regular. <laughs> You can hear all the sounds echoing off of the empty yeah. stadium back yep. at the... That too. It's just <laughs> yeah, it's so crazy. loud to hear a game on the radio and you're like, really wish I could hear these announcers. They're also, averaging like 3,000 people a game. Yeah, the majority... Uh, they're, the Oakland A's triple A team averages like double the attendance per game than the Oakland A's do. It's just no one wants to come. It's a... Like, and... You know, it's very, it's sad. Like, for those fans and stuff, the ownership doesn't care. They want to move to greener pastures in Vegas. And so they've just completely gutted the team. And they have done no stadium renovations whatsoever since, like, the 80s. It is outdated. It's it's a damn crime what is happening to Oakland A's fans. I, I do feel really bad for them. I got a question you guys would probably know better than I do. When a team is moving, I don't know. Okay, we should probably preface this by saying the Oakland A's bought some property in Las Vegas and planning to move there in 2027 is what I read. Well, I think it's actually even going to happen sooner than that. Yeah. I believe that there is a like a minor league stadium out there in Vegas already. Yeah, oh, for wow. the uh, the Las Vegas 51s. Okay. Uh, there's a triple A team out there. And I believe that... I don't know, maybe as soon as uh, the next two years, the A's will be playing in that minor league stadium. I've heard some people say 2025. When yeah. I read the initial report of they bought property in Vegas to you know, build a stadium, then that maybe it's that that might be ready by 2027. Anyway, the question I have for you guys is when a team moves, does that affect their AAA teams at all? Or do they just stay where they're at? And They just stay where they're at. And also kind of it's... It's actually pretty uncommon what the Mariners have mm -hmm. with Tacoma being right down the damn street. Yeah, because our double A is all the way in Toledo. Deep ass bumfuck Arkansas. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. The Travelers. So yeah. um, I think there is a rule. I heard recently on some podcast there is a rule about you can't have your minor league team within a certain amount of miles. So somehow Tacoma and Seattle are just far apart. I didn't look it up, but. It, like I think there's some rule about they can't be like super close, but it is nice to have Tacoma and Seattle so close because we are way up here in the Northwest and we have to travel a lot. And it's nice to be able to swap players when both teams are in town up here nice and easily. Or when we're even down towards Toledo, we can get guys from double A if we just need a pitcher to throw bullets and like use him and be like, all right, you're on our roster for this Southeast road trip. And then we're then sending you back. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow st still took Kyle Lewis three days to find Tacoma from Seattle though. <laughs> Could have walked there. In this <laughs> <Yeah>. time. <laughs> Got lost on the bus. All right. So I remember we were having a discussion, Owen, about 
George Springer and how Julio is kind of a George Springer esque leadoff man. Um, and uh, we were talking about if he has the record for leadoff home runs. He doesn't. And I remember during that discussion, I was like, I think he has the record for leadoff home runs. And we kind of agreed. But Can I guess who it is? Yeah, you can. Is it Ricky Henderson? Yeah. yeah. Yes! <laughs> so during that discussion, in my head, like I was like, yeah, I think he has the leadoff home run record. And in my head, immediately, it was like Ricky Henderson. And I didn't say anything, but we moved on. But also, Craig Biggio is second. I, think, I remember oh, this, yeah. Yeah, so I think... George Springer is about to pass Biggio, but Ricky Henderson's the guy. He's had most leadoff home runs by, I think, quite a few. But Springer might make a run at it. Also, it helped that Henderson played for like 20 years. He was awesome. Yeah. A a classic Oakland A, which brought that to mind. So (laughs) I just want to say, yeah, like I feel super bad for Oakland A's fans. They couldn't get this stadium built. They've had so many great legacies in the 70s. 1989, uh, you know, that's about it. But, um, they've <laughs> but it's a been team in, with history. Yeah, I love that team. I've been a fan of them multiple times in my life, like on and off kind of, just when there's exciting players there like Matt Chapman, Matt Olson, Miguel Tejada, Eric Chavez. Barry dude. Zito. <laughs> yeah, Barry, Barry Zito, Zito. Mark Zito. Mulder, Tim Hudson, all those guys. Like, they have eras where they have such great players there like players you want to watch terrence long (laughs) so i mean those a's fans once they go to vegas i mean they're not going to become giants fans do we welcome them in yeah yeah with open arms 700 of them (laughs) yeah Yeah, we can we can fit them yeah we got room in our ballpark (laughs) see the real fans don't go to the games they boycotted the games they don't go i gotta imagine like some diehards are like well they're going to be gone. I might as well take advantage now because, like, you know, in five years, I can't go anymore. And I mean, in five years, I'd be like, dang, I really wish I would have gone more. Like, I really wish I would have stayed with that boycott when they didn't even do anything. I mean, now that they bought land and they know they're moving, they're going to have big, like, games where they have a lot of people there. But they're going to plan which day they all go at the same time. You know, to have like a party, basically. I the think anti boycott. Yeah, yeah. I saw yeah, that they teach him. they were planning to <laughs> do a, like a reverse boycott before the announcement of the sale happened. So now I don't even think that's happening because what's even the point? The point that they were trying to do with a reverse boycott is they were trying to get as many people to fill the stadium on a specific day. It was see what be- you can do if you give a shit, mm-hmm. yeah. and it was going to be a middle of the week game during summer so uh it would be like a random wednesday game which traditionally for almost all bar ballparks isn't filled to the top because it's a random it's a random weekday so they were going to pick the day which would for average teams have low attendance and they were going to use that game to reverse boycott the park and fill it up as much as they could as kind of like this is what can happen if you guys show that you care but now with the announcement of the sell and everything, and um, or the moving, I don't even think they're gonna follow through with it. Cause what is the point? And I'm just trying to put myself in an A's fan. Like imagine just the heartbreak of finding out the Mariners are moving to Montana, or so. Or I guess even something further than that, you know. But just like Idaho, or, it'd be like Portland, most likely. Oh, I'd be so pissed. Yeah, that would be I just be don't awful. think there's a market in Portland for a baseball team. The ones that are up for like expansion in the cities are like Charlotte and Nashville, I think, right? I think Portland's talked about, but I just don't see that happening. Yeah, it's been kicked around for a while, but of like, oh, maybe Portland will get an expansion team, but I've never really seen anything about it like coming to fruition or even like getting in the first steps. So I I don't know. I mean, it would be kind of cool to have a Portland team. Immediate rivals. That would be cool. Less travel. I think yeah. it'd be really cool to have a Portland team. I've heard Salt Lake City kicked, yep. kicked around. What yeah. if British and Columbia had a team? Another uh, Canadian team? Yeah, why be not? Tough. It'd be tough for Mariners fans. I would, but it'd be kind of cool to have that rivalry, especially with the Kraken around now. There's already like a Canada-Washington rivalry thing going on. Yeah. And with the what, Whitecaps and the Sounders, yep. there's already like that rivalry happening. Let's make it happen in baseball, it to too. baseball. Yeah. Come on, BC. 
It would be nice to team. have a... Come on, BC, step up. Get baseball. Yeah, come on. It'd be sick. It would be crazy to have a bunch of BC fans at Alaska Timo team. and then a <laughs> bunch of Seattle fans also in BC, you know, just... They'd yeah, have that, to be that close rivalry would be really cool. Less travel. Also, when we expand, they're going to shake up the divisions a little bit. So, I mean, someone a little closer would be nice. With the A's leaving, it's like, dude, we're yeah. just so boned every way you look at it. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, having like a, a, a rivalry team so close is like really fun. It's like being able to yeah. travel there and see. And, you know, our rivals are what? The Angels or the Astros? Like I'm not going to Houston. <laughs> the Rangers just, now, apparently. <laughs> it's all the way in Texas. Who cares? Yeah, who can't talk like, shit? To- <laughs> I'm not going to go to any of these teams. If we yeah. had a Portland team or even a BC team, that'd be really cool to go. I don't yeah. have a passport. I can't go. You just need a <laughs> driver's license. You could get license, one and be more travel days for us. It'd be super fun to go see games in those yeah. cities. Can make it a point. We could drive. Like it'd yeah. be sick to drive to it a rival be. place and have a little vacation and be those guys. Do a guys. pod in a hotel room. That would yeah. be sick. It'd exactly. be super meaningful. So <laughs> I know the Port- Portland has like the Portland Pickles. I think right. Yeah, a minor league. Yeah, I mean they're popping. They're f- they fucking love that shit there. I mean they're always packed house. So, I mean, there might be a market, maybe not as big as like Nashville or Memphis. Or- Portland seems like a nice minor league baseball place. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I have a little aside. After the game last night, Saturday, um, there's a bunch of fans in Cardinals gear, right? Bunch of Mariners fans. Everyone's walking around outside the stadium. There's one guy in a Houston Astros jersey <laughs> and a Houston Astros hat walking down like the street, and I see him coming, and I'm motion at him. I'm like looking him up and down and doing Dude, the who whole. Who are like, you? What, <laughs> is, what is this? What are you doing? And he's like. Winners, winners. And like walk by. I was like, we'll fucking see, dude. I don't know. What he did loser. have a sick Jordan Alvarez jersey, though. I like Jordan. I can't help it. Houston Astros fans are just definitely those. They just like want to be obnoxious and they want to get attention so bad. They like play into the, yeah, we cheated, but we won. So cry about it. Da, 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 da. Honestly, uh, yeah, screw the Astros fans. And you know what? I will say wholeheartedly. That one day the Astros dynasty will trickle back down. I mean, no team is amazing forever. You're going to have ups and downs. And I guarantee you 100% when the Astros fans start having those down years again, there's going to be no fans left. They are so bandwagon over there. And yeah, they are one of the best teams in baseball. And they have been for the last, I don't know, five, six years. They've been routinely one of the top teams in baseball. They do have a dynasty brewing right now, and, you know, that good for them. But when it stops, you're going to find the Astros fans shut up immediately. They're not going to ride with that team if they lose 100 games in a season. Everyone, They will all just disperse and find something else to be a fan of until the Astros fans are good again. Or the Astros are good again. And that's one thing, I mean... With the Mariners, like, obviously, our fandom has grown with last year with the Mariners being better and stuff. But, I mean, we've been, spent some time in the trenches, and you could still find people talking Mariners when they were on, you know, year 17 of their 20-year drought. You could still find people to talk Mariners with. And even in their worst seasons, Mariners still averaged, like, 15 overall in attendance of people like going to games and stuff. So it's still, there's, we have put the time in Cincinnati red fans have put the time in the last remaining Oakland A fans have put the time in and those, these now new Astros fans, they, they will jump ship the minute it starts tipping over. I, I cannot wait for right. that to happen. Yeah, it sounds like that guy Matt ran into is one of those guys. 100%. Winners. You know, okay. Where are you going to be when they start to suck, dude? Yeah, it was funny. I was like, what the? Who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Jersey, like, I don't mind all the St. Louis fans. A lot of them are really, like, respectful people. I'm surprised how well-traveled they are. They came all the way out here and made a super good show. I just think there's a lot of fans or they're out just here. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, like we kind of discussed uh, earlier... Uh, before the pod started of just like now with teams being able to travel and play everywhere in the season, 
that you're going to see more fans of teams not from the town. Like, for example, when I went to Wrigley Field to watch the Cubs play the Mariners a couple years back, I ran into a handful of Mariners fans. Uh, obviously not as well-traveled as this St. Louis group was, but it wasn't like I was just the only Mariners jersey. I found other Mariners fans to talk to and say what's up to during the con- in the concourse and stuff. And also, mad shout-out to both White Sox and Cubs fans. You guys were amazing and super fun. I thoroughly enjoyed your guys' stadiums. Shout-out to all of Chicago. Hell yeah. Speaking of Chicago, those White Sox City Connect jerseys are flames, dude. Those go so hard. They're actually one of the only City Connect jerseys that I really, really like. And you don't even like pinstripes. No. But they're really wide pinstripes. Yeah, and it's like different, although... They do kind of have that pajama look to them a little bit. <laughs> I think but, they're sick as hell. But I like the black and white and the big south side Ooh, across south the chest. Side. Ooh. Um, the Padres looks like a little kid's art project. I know you hate that, but I think it's so cool. I it think it's cool. I don't, it yeah, looks I like nothing it like, like a baseball uniform. It's like, that sun, it's like that sunset vibe of like the 70s, you know? It's San Diego, dude. Mm-hmm. It looks like Miami Vice. Yeah, it does kind of yeah. look a little I mean, kind Miami. of a subdued Miami Vice, because it's not like bright and neon, but it is a bunch of colors, but they're I guess they're on the more mellow-ish side. I was going to say it's a little bit, speaking of Miami, it's a little bit like when the Marlins change their colors, like blue and orange and yellow, and I just didn't like the combination. Mm-hmm. It's very Miami, I guess. It works yeah. for them, but I'm just not a big fan of it. Kind of reminds me of that, but like way poppier and flashier. Mm-hmm. With the Padres, like, neon vibe, like, it gives them so many nice accent pieces, like their shoes, their socks, their, you know, shoelaces, their uh, sunglasses, everything, that what they can put in their hair, it, it just makes it fun, you know? They have so many nice, like, bright accents, and it makes baseball look kind of, yeah, Nickelodeon for a minute. <laughs> yeah, dude, which is really cool. So, along with this talk of... The City Connect jerseys. The Mariners are getting their own City Connect jerseys this year. And it has already been leaked. And I saw, I actually saw when it first leaked on Twitter, it was literally like some dude at like a packaging warehouse or whatever. There was boxes of them meant for distribution. And he fucking took a picture of it and put it on Twitter. Which, I mean, that's how leaks happen. Uh, Quick side note, I hate that kind of stuff. I hate leaks. And honestly, when they find out like who did it, that dude's getting fired for sure. I mean, worth it. Worth it for that one day of clout. <laughs> yep. But that one moment of Twitter clout is all that matters. All that matters. Yeah. But uh, it, they did get leaked. If you guys haven't seen it yet, um, you can find them online. They're uh, fugly. I, well, I, let's talk about it. Yeah. Let, well, let's discuss the City Connect jerseys. So essentially, it is. It looks very familiar to the old Seattle Pilots jersey. And it's uh, got kind of the bright yellow. It does have a Pacific Northwest patch on the arm. And it does have a My Oh My patch on it. But realistically, that's the only thing that really connects it to the city is the My Oh My. I mean, the Pilots are the Brewers now. It's not even the same team. It's not like the Pilots became the Mariners. Yeah. So I feel it as instead of a city connect, it looks more like a throwback alternate jersey. That's all it looks like to me. So I don't think I don't hate the jersey itself. I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, I just I think it fails as a city connect jersey. So I kind of have a different view where like, yeah, the pilots moved to Milwaukee and they're the Brewers and the Brewers kind of do some of that stuff like pilots throwback type jersey sometimes and the mariners do too but i think if you think about it the seattle pilots is a seattle team even though they move to another city doesn't make it not part of seattle's history like they're trying to do a throwback to another team that was in seattle that we wish would have panned out but we ended up getting the mariners another decade later which thank god to you know revitalize baseball in seattle but I don't mind going back to the pilots thing. I just don't think it's exciting. I totally agree. I mean, it it totally looks like a updated version of a pilots jersey. 
It's got a similar font. The PNW patch is kind of cool. Represent- I like the My Oh My. I love the My Oh My. Isn't it kind of low on the jersey? Like if you tuck your pants in, you're just not going to see it. I th- I thought they were on both patches were I on hope either it's on the arm. arm. It better be on the like arm, the sleeve dude. of each arm. One was the PNW, the other was the My Oh My. Love the My Oh My. That's so sick. But yeah, man, I I'll, I think it totally fails as a City Connect jersey. There's nothing besides pilots that's like City Connected, like. If you're gonna go for the throwback look, dude, that Steelheads um, throwback uniform was way sicker, and it was like a like the most basic font: mm-hmm. gray shirt, black lettering. The hat was black with a like couldn't be more standard S, and that shit hits, dude. It looks good. Like, why go all out for this dumbass blue and gold thing? I'm super sick of gold, by the way. I don't want any more gold in my Mariners merch. <laughs> don't like it. I'm over that shit, dude. Nothing about this city is gold. Everything is green and gray. Look at Seattle, dude. It's Emerald gray city. as fuck. Emerald City. Emerald City. We got some trees mixed in with some gray. Whole bunch of gray. Make a gray jersey if you really want to connect with this city. If you really want to connect with this city, have everyone wear a flannel shirt and don't wash your hair. (laughs) That's what I think. The flannel shirts don't even have to be the same color. Just buy one at Goodwill, show up unwashed, there you go, Seattle City Connect. And have like a craft beer of some sort as a patch. Yeah, show up drunk (laughs) on IPA. Smoking your own rolled cigarettes. Oh my god! That's a city connect. That's a fucking right city connect. Players rolling stogies in the dugout, dude. They're all wearing the beanies. <laughs> yeah, some of them have beanies. Oh yeah. come on! What is this? What is this blue and gold? I'm over it. Yeah, I think the they really missed the mark. It's like it's supposed to represent the city. Like I, I get the the tie into the pilots, but like that shit was so long ago. A blue and gold. Whoop de fucking do. We have the Space Needle, which is like the most iconic building in the Northwest. We have the Puget Sound, which is pretty unique. We have orcas. We have trees, like really beautiful trees, beautiful sunsets. We have mountains. Like you, they couldn't have done anything with some sort of skyline, city, the skyline of the city, the Space Needle, the trees and the mountains and the water and orcas, like just blue and gold. That's the most boring shit. Like. I just, just, I just, they missed a mark, and I just, I don't know what, like, I want to see their other draft ideas, because, like, this was, like, clearly the most low-effort shit. They're like, hey, let's just do a throwback. Bullshit. I will say, I think part of the issue is that they blew their load using the landmarks that Owen's talking about in our All-Star uh, Ooh. logo. Because the All-Star logo has the Space Needle, has the mountains, has all this stuff. But again, you know, incorporate it. Incorporate the All-Star logo into the City Connect jersey in some way. And I do agree a lot with Ona saying, I, the only thing I differ with is like, I think the jersey is fine on its own. I just don't like it as a City Connect. But I think that could have been the issue. They ha- And honestly, at this level of like major leagues and stuff, so much corporations and big stuff. I'm sure that logo is probably trademarked up to Yin Yang for the All-Star game and probably couldn't find overlap with the creators of that logo and then money changing hands, whatever. Who knows? I, but I think, yeah, they took a lot of that stuff to use for the 2023 All-Star game logo and then just kind of did, oh, well, we used all of our good ideas. Well, how about a patch? Good speculation, man. I didn't think about any of that, like the All-Star game being here. But I did have an idea about my vision of what the City Connect jersey should be since the All-Star game is here this year. Do you remember the 2001 All-Star game where they had those nice emerald green jerseys? Mm -hmm. I say, you know, bring back the emerald green. Emerald City, it's kind of Starbucks greenish. And put a space needle or a skyline on there. Put a fairy on there. Put orcas on there. Like Owen's saying, we have all these things. Have you ever looked west when the sun is setting over the Olympics? Goddamn. <laughs> have you ever looked east <laughs> over like towards Mount Sai and driven up through Snoqualmie and stuff? The mountains to sound is what we. That's where we live. That's what this is. You know, the trees, the the sound, the mountains, everything. 
skiing, snowboarding. Put something cool on there. Put a nice fade. Put a skyline. Give us a little bit of teal, a little bit of sunset colors even. Yeah, like Garrett's saying, the gold's overplayed. The pilots, we've already done throwback pilot stuff. I've seen it in the shop. Like, they already do this. Do something else, Nike. Like, get a good collab going. I don't understand. They kind of missed the mark. Dude, do a pilot's reference. I don't care. That's fine. I'm sick of gold. Get gold out of here. At least put an airplane or something yeah, on totally there. Yeah, totally put an airplane. Hydroplanes yep. in the airplane. Like, a, put some blue angels on that bitch. I'm saying. Anything. But no, just blue and gold with some pilot's font. It's weird to me, because, like, Nike... I've been on their campus before in Beaverton and they have a Griffey building and like the first floor is open to the public and everything. And it's like a, the whole layout of that first floor is a straight tribute to Griffey. That's awesome. They have like the number of his career home runs and it's like embossed using all of the bats he used. I'm sure they're, I'm sure the replicas, but it's like beautiful and That's they have sick, cleats though. and they have autographs and it's really, really cool. And then we come with this bum ass city connect jersey. I just don't. There's just I just like they just drop the ball. I'm I'm upset about it. <laughs> I'm a little upset about it as well. Put Edgar Martinez's face on the front of the thing. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Anything, bro, better than this blue and gold. And it looks like the the city connect jerseys will be officially launched on April 28th, and they will be worn in game on May 5th. Against the Astros. So just coming up, we're going to make our debut and everyone else can see the jerseys in action and see what they're like. And, you know, hopefully, I mean, is it set in stone? Can they come up with one next year and make it better? But let's just hope there's something different. Let's hope. I don't know. They did kind of miss the mark. But no, it's not going to miss the mark. The Mariners in their upcoming series against the Phillies and the Jays. Let's hope for a good standing from them. Uh, and lots of competitive ball and we'll talk to you guys all about it next week make sure to like comment share subscribe tell your friends hit me with a text if there's a topic you want us to talk about right on youtube anything we'll get some uh topics going for you guys and we can't wait to talk to you next time thank you guys all for listening and go Go Mariners. mariners